Good morning, I'm Adam Sexton. She won a decisive re-election victory in the November election, and now Senator Jean Shaheen is back to work for a third term in a very busy U.S. Senate as part of a newly minted but narrow Democratic majority. The senator is our guest this morning, connecting with us from Washington. Thanks for joining us, Senator Shaheen. Nice to be with you. All right, we want to give you full credit for doing this on no sleep after a <laughs> long night of votes in the Senate, but there's a lot to get to here. So let's start a with lot, the stimulus. Oh. A lot to do, yeah, as you exactly. said. Exactly. Let's start with those stimulus checks. Uh, just within the last uh, 12 hours or so, uh, the Senate did pass a means test, essentially, for those. Can you describe the cap, where the cutoff is going to be, who's going to qualify for these checks, and who won't? Well, the amendment we passed was what we call a messaging amendment. It really doesn't have uh, force of law. It was designed to send a signal to the administration and to point out that uh, sort of a sense of the Senate that we think those direct payments should go to those people who are most in need. And we hope that the administration is going to hear us. And that as we produce a final bill, that it will be targeted to those families who need it the most. So this is essentially more of a lifeline than a stimulus. Is it going to be probably at about that same 150,000 family level, essentially, where it starts to diminish? Um, I think that's probably, well, it depends on what the administration does, but I, that's generally the range in which the bipartisan vote that was passed is looking at. You know, I, I think it's important to point out that there is good data to show that when the last stimulus checks were done back under the CARES Act, that for people earning over a certain amount, over about 75000 for an individual, that many of those families banked those checks. They didn't spend them. Um, and so the, the goal here is to get them to people who need them the most, who are going to spend them, who need to buy food, need to pay the rent, uh, get their cars inspected, whatever it is, and um, rather than putting those dollars into the bank. New Hampshire's towns and cities are staring down the barrel of some pretty serious property tax increases just to level fund government or perhaps have a few cuts here and there. Is there a sense yet how much municipal aid might be coming in this next relief package? Well, the proposal as it was submitted to the Congress has $360 billion in state and local aid. Now that comes in a variety of ways, but as you point out, what I've heard from municipalities all across New Hampshire is just how much they've been affected by COVID-19, how it's affecting their revenues that are coming in. They're concerned about laying off uh, workers, firefighters, police, teachers, and we really need to provide some help for them. And that's what this package would do. Now, it's been a bone of contention. It's been one of the areas where it's been most difficult to get bipartisan agreement. But I'm hopeful that as we continue to negotiate, we're going to be able to get that help to the communities that need it. You got vaccinated uh, for COVID-19 in quite dramatic fashion during the attack on the Capitol back on January 6th when you had to shelter with other senators in close quarters trying to stay away from that uh, murderous mob. The NHGOP ended up attacking you for, quote, jumping the line to get a vaccine. What's your reaction to that? I think it's going to be important to get the vaccine out to as many people as possible. As you say, on the advice of the Capitol Hill physician based on what happened on January 6th, um, I went ahead and got my vaccination and I hope that we're gonna get the vaccines out as fast as possible to everyone who needs them. We all need to be working together to do this and stop making this a political issue um, attacking each other and get this done. We have good news in that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which only requires one shot, is applying for their emergency use authorization. Hopefully they're gonna get that in an expedited fashion and that vaccine is gonna be out to enjoy to join the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. So we'll have three that are gonna be available. But what we've got to do is get shots into people's arms and we've gotta to work together to do that. A lot of Granite Staters are fairly frustrated right now with the vaccine rollout. Should they just be patient, as Governor Sununu has asked, or do you think the governor has kind of messed this up? Well, again, I think the best thing we can do is all of us work together. And I appreciate the frustration that people have. And our family, we've had uh, challenges with the website getting scheduled as well. But... The point is, again, let's figure out what's not working, let's make it work, and let's all 
work together. Let's get these vaccines out. One of the biggest challenges is getting the vaccines distributed. We've got to get that done. That's why getting the funding that's in this COVID relief package is so important. There's funding in there to help with vaccine distribution, to help with people who are going to actually administer the vaccines. There's help for um, genomic research so we can trace those new variants of the virus that are coming in, which is going to be so important. There's help for testing and tracing. We've again, got to really ramp up our testing because what we're hearing from the experts is that even after we get vaccinated, we still need to wear the mask. We need to test regularly. We need to make sure that we're not infecting anybody else because we, what we're still not sure about is that all of the vaccines are safe against actually carrying the virus even though you've been vaccinated. So we know that we might still be um, carriers who can um, convey that vaccine to somebody in our families, somebody we're talking to or meeting with. So it's important to continue to be very careful. Let's return to the attack on the Capitol and the looming impeachment trial of former President Trump. Because this happened to the Congress and to the Senate, does this trial need to be two or three weeks? Because everybody saw what they saw. Well, it's not just about what happened on January 6th. It's also about the events that led up to January 6th. It's about a, a period over months where Donald Trump talked about and tried actively to undermine the election on November 3rd, where he refused to accept the results of that election, where he clearly incited people on January 6th. and. So I think we need to not only see what happened on the 6th, which I think is um, probably the worst, uh, the worst action any president could do is to try and overturn a free and fairly elected government. That's essentially a coup on the United States of America. And we need to have the information come out. We need to find out what happened. We need to find out who funded it. We need to find out what Donald Trump's role was in that. And that's what this impeachment trial is all about. Should the former president be compelled to testify under oath? You know, that's his attorneys and the House impeachment managers will make that determination. What we heard this week is that the president is not going to testify under oath. You know, given the president's, the former president's inability to tell the truth, it's, um, it would be very interesting to have him sworn in so that he is um, legally responsible to tell the truth, but his attorneys have said that's not going to happen. What about your colleagues, Senator Cruz and Senator Hawley in particular? Were their actions and words colored after the fact by what happened, the violence and the death? Or do you believe they committed sedition? Well, I said before January 6th that I thought those people who were advocating overturning the election on November the 3rd that has was determined to be free and fair by everyone from Chris Krebs, who was head of the agency within Homeland Security appointed by Donald Trump, um, who said it was the fairest election in history, to Bill Barr, who as attorney general said it was a free and fair election, and to continue to spread lies and advocate that it was not free and fair and refuse to tell people the truth, I think is going against not only what what we expect of individuals, but particularly for elected officials, to tell voters the truth is what I think we should all be held to a higher standard. Now, I'm on the ethics committee. There has been a complaint filed against both Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley. And so I'm, I'm not gonna get into any more details than that, but I have been on record as saying it's important. And those people who have tried, who have spread the lie that that election was um, not free and fair and continued to tell voters what Donald Trump was saying, uh, need to be held accountable for that. I know this is the other body, but it seems like everybody on Capitol Hill is being asked for their thoughts about Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Should duly elected individuals like her face sanction being stripped of committee assignments just because they believe in wacky conspiracy theories? 
Well, I think, again, as an elected official, all of us have a responsibility to try and be honest with voters and to not advocate violence and um, actions that would undermine our government and actions that would cause people to create um, violent acts against each other. Now, the House took action against Ms. Green yesterday, and I think as a body, we need to be able to hold our members accountable for what they do and say. Yeah, indeed, that QAnon conspiracy does end uh, with a mass execution, so not exactly the most uh, positive of conspiracy theories to be following. There has been a lot of talk of unity. Is that even possible in this political atmosphere? Oh, I think so. You know, we had this, um, when we did the Votorama as part of the budget resolution to move the COVID-19 package, um, we spent from about 2.30 in the afternoon to about 5.30 in the morning, uh, all senators on the floor, and there was a lot of bipartisan agreement. I worked with Lisa Murkowski from Alaska on um, an amendment that says we need to increase funding for domestic violence programs, for child abuse prevention programs. That amendment passed 100 to zero. So there are areas where we can agree and we should work together to try and, and get things done because that's what the people of this country expect of us. All right, Senator, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with a look at foreign policy and the next steps the senator thinks the Biden administration should take with Russia.